Hello, and welcome to round four of Novacore. Round four was the Sunday. We would be playing Rescue, and I would be playing against my good friend from Canberra, Ed Sykes. This is Ed's list on screen now, and can we all just please have a moment to appreciate how much of an absolute giga chad someone has to be to take Spiral Core to this event? Not only is the scenario lineup deeply hostile to them just kind of natively, it wants lots of hacking, which they can't do, and it's countermeasures, which they are bad at. Like, not terrible, but Spiral Core really has to stretch to play countermeasures. On top of that, two other things. Spiral Core has just received a hard, hard nerf in the Fireteam update, functionally knocking two points of Ballistic Skill off of their Tricore ability in exchange for nothing, which is terrible, and you will actually see the complete absence of Tricore in this list, and I think also maybe in his other list. But also, also, Morant Aggression Force has just come out, its models are in people's hands, and they're probably going to be popular. And Morant Aggression Force is the hardest counter to Spiral Core imaginable. Fortunately for Ed, I'm not playing Morant Aggression Force, and he doesn't run into them this far in the event. And he is, in fact, right now, as we go into round four, at the absolute top of the leaderboard. He has spent day one committing a series of surgical and extremely high-scoring murders, uh, and is undefeated on three majors with more points than I have. So props, strong props to Ed for getting this far. He will eventually go on to finish 10th at the event. Um, and anyone who is playing Spiral Core, I encourage you to take a look at this list. Um, if nothing else, it is interesting and it is an example of how Spiral Core needs to adapt to the kind of savage metagame and nerfs they found themselves in, in and then post Nova Core. So this list is built around uh, three Dral, who have AP Marksman Rifles and Mine Layer, and then the third Dral is a Submachine Gun and is a Mine Layer. Most of the SWC is being spent here, and it affords three mines in the midfield. Um, along with, we have a Tagma Multispectral Visor. In this game, it will be pretending to be Nima, Nima Sitar, but it gives the uh, the obligatory counterintelligence, in addition to being kind of just quite a good... quite a good... Uh, Sniper. It will be linked with a Kosil and a Kriegel so that the, there is smoke in the group. The Kosil mine layer is kind of a special flex of Ed's, and it is it is a really cool piece that Spiral Core needs to look into, and frankly, Toha could as well. It is well standard, reasonably costed, 26 points. It's functionally like many Toha pieces, it's a symbiomer piece, which means that it is packing two wounds. Um, it has D charges and it's medium infantry in order to do specialist or um, classified missions. It is a mine layer with mines, which is very relevant under some circumstances, and it has a linkable K1 combi rifle. In addition to the AP marksman rifles and the submachine gun, this K1 is like this is Yotam poison. This is how Spiral Core deal with a tag, because they can't deal with it by hacking it. They have Ferroware, but Ferroware is useless against every tag except the Gorgos. So this, this Corsair as a linkable piece is a, a nice, like it is an interesting addition, and it I think it has served Ed very well, including when he played against a double Yotam list at a local event we had in the lead up to Novacore. The rest of the list is padded out by Chaxes, a diplomatic delegate, two helots. Uh, they are one of the only for the SWC for one light rocket launcher, so there's also a submachine gun. There is Ed's signature Gryphop, and there is a chain of command Kaeltar, the expensive version, the 28.1, which lets you afford two symbiomates. And those two symbiomates mean that both of the Dral marksman rifles, the primary attack pieces of the list, who, by the way, do not play linked, uh, are ha they have symbiomates in order to keep the symbio armor intact, because a, a Dral is kind of an exception to the usual Toha rule, where they don't they don't just decay when they lose their first wound, they really decay. They go down from 6-2 movement to 4-4, four, four, they lose all of their mimetism, they lose their dodge ability, and I think they even lose a point of ballistic skill. The, the Dral transmutation is savage, so each of them having a symbiomate is a really nice way of just keeping them in the fight generally for a few hits. I don't believe this is the list Ed took in countermeasures, but I wouldn't be surprised if he took it in quite a few other scenarios in any case. He was also playing it here in Rescue, and Exclusion Zone kind of pins the Dral back a little bit, but all of the Mines and all of the Eraser nevertheless puts it in a quite good position in this scenario. 
As I look at it, there are only actually two eraser pieces. It certainly felt like there were more on the field, but those two were made to count quite well. I do wonder how well this list played into Morats. I know Ed in round five would play into Morats on a corridor table where he couldn't keep them at range with the marksman rifles and the snipers. And I know he lost that round, um, but I wonder if he played this list or his other one. I assume he played this list. It should play reasonably well in comm center. So this was the table, and importantly, this was the table after calling the TOs over and saying, hey, this table is a hellscape. Can we do something about it, please? Um, this is a Sydney table, and I would say it reflects some of the worst of what I've seen from Sydney tables in Australia. They play easily the most open of any of the Australian major city matters. Uh, Queensland, Queensland plays, for example, if you look at Queensland, Queensland will play tables that have clear lines of movement to accommodate, for example, the movement of tags, but are like robustly geometrically built. And Queensland tables have places where there is cover and places where you can defend and places where you can attack. And they are, they are functional and utilitarian in like a good way. I've never played on a Queensland table that I don't like, even though they are kind of open. Melbourne tables are pretty similar, but sometimes kind of forget that deployment zones are important. Although Melbourne tables have been slightly unfairly maligned by Nick from Loss of Lieutenants' recent attempts to build intentionally bad tables as a training mechanism, which are terrible and intentionally bad, but I guess it's worth having that effect. Canberra tables, I would say, tend to be overcomplicated because I like playing on complicated tables and I am often the one who sets them up. Um, but Sydney tables frequently are too sparse. Uh, they often look fantastic. Aesthetically, this kind of terrain is clean and wonderful and nice and they make good use of it. And there's like, like all of this wonderful acrylic that like plays beautifully. But this table we have added a bunch of terrain to and we have pushed it together. Um, before we called the TOs over and said, both of us hate this, can we do something? Um, the table was combining two of the worst aspects that you could have on an infinity table. The first was that it was a Swiss cheese table. So there was like plenty of scatter that didn't block line of sight to anything. You would be able to have partial cover, probably from attacks, which is all well and good, but nothing could move without being shot. There was this one, so this, this club here, um, was in the middle of the table and did block some line of fire. But everything else, see all of these pieces here, all of them had like two or three inch gaps between them. So what that ended up with, a table that looked busy, but just there was no way to maneuver. There was no, there were no shapes to play around. There was no total cover anywhere. Uh, also, it combined the second thing that is bad about infinity tables, which is deployment zones that are death traps. Um, we have kind of fixed them up in this table. Uh, I, I think the deployment zone I have is is fine, but we had to do a fair bit of work and the TOs helped us out. Um, we pushed things together to create actual nooks that you could place things. Um, we created like most of the actual shapes in the deployment zone. We put cover in places beyond, like we didn't have just the, the rear six inches completely empty. Don't do that, by the way. Um, I am not of the same opinion that I know Gav is, which is that every table must have a Rassiat walk-in point. Um, like this, uh, this, this big crate here. I know he doesn't actually think that, by the way, that's me taking the piss. Um, we have what we call the Phoenix test and Gab is aware of the Phoenix test, which is that, um, in 2017, a very good steel phalanx player won CanCon by walking a Enomatakos link with Phoenix up the board to the enemy deployment zone and then firing enfilade fire up the deployment zone until everything was dead. Enfilade fire, for those who are not familiar with the term, refers to cannon fire up the length of a trench, which is to say fire up the enemy's line at an angle against which they don't have cover. Um, this is opposed to defilade fire, which is fire fired directly at an enemy position in cover, usually with the intention of suppressing them. So I am going first in this scenario, but imagine, if you will, a, uh, a big piece with a gun that is here, shooting in this direction. That is enfilade fire. And in this circumstance, it would kill many, many things. This is why you want cover in your deployment zones, not just facing toward the enemy deployment zone, but also facing towards its own flanks, making shapes. So for example, this position here, we've pushed these two terrain pieces together. In doing so, they create a nook in which a piece can hide and cannot be obliterated by enfilade fire. 
If an enemy got up onto, say, this building, it would be able to see it, but it wouldn't be able to see a piece that was prone back here, thus breaking the enfilade. This is kind of like I'm using a oh, big word. What does this mean, enfilade? Um, but it just deployment zones need to be survivable. The game sucks when you get alpha off the table on the first turn. Make it so that deployment zones make that not happen. It's not particularly complicated. It is so easy. Just do a quick test. Look at a DZ and think, if I delivered a gun to this deployment zone, how much of my opponent's army would I kill? And if the answer is all of it, you fucked up the DZ, right? The game is meant to be played over three turns. The game is funner when it's played over three turns. Don't let the turn one alpha wipe people out. I feel strongly about this. Anyway, we fixed this table up. The TOs helped. They ferried in some terrain. Um, you can see like crate here, crate here, train of some description, crates here, and here, this stuff was all added by the TOs who then helped us reposition things. So we ended up with a table that was playable. But uh, yes, Sydney tables need to uh, need to knock this shit off because it's just it's just deeply unpleasant. Um, that said, critique finished. Uh, the game itself. So I have won the role. I this was the mission where I picked the anathematic list, and I suspect it was probably a mistake. And the main reason it was a mistake is that I had rolled, I'd drawn my classifieds, and the only one I could complete was sabotage. And I could only complete that with the Raicho list. But I picked the anathematic list, and I picked it for two reasons. The first reason is I was familiar with the lists Ed had been experimenting with. Things like that K1 Cosail and the Drahl. I didn't know what was in his lists exactly, but I knew that he was trying that stuff out. And I was a little scared to take a tag. Which is good, by the way. The meta should remain hostile to tags. The second reason, again, was that Ed is also... Ed is actually primarily a very good defensive player, but he's playing Spiral Core, which means impersonators and counterintelligence. And it's just a good rule of thumb. If you play against him, go first. He'll put a Grife somewhere. You can kill it. It's a huge pain in the ass if that thing gets to activate and start killing like Imatrons. So I just accepted that the price I would have to pay is belt my head into Ed's defenses. And in doing so, I was giving, I, I was sorry, I was afraid of the attack. And so I picked the list that was more defensive, which had the anathematic. This was probably wrong, but it was only really wrong in hindsight. Um, the main thing that I wasn't thinking about when I picked this list was... The Riot Show is a fast moving piece that is not impetuous and has veteran and also structure, so it can't be isolated by erasers. With the anathematic taking its place, I did not have any elements that could push through an eraser network, which would, I was able to play around, but would cause trouble. So I've run the role, Sap picked first turn, Ed has picked, I think, the better of the two deployment zones, and this is my deployment here. The most exposed piece that I've positioned is actually Bit and Kiss. They are hanging out here. And I was pretty sure they were safe, but they would end up getting very, very shot from this rooftop and dying, which is a shame. I needed their order and I didn't have it. That's okay. So Bit is there. Kiss is fine. It's fine if Kiss dies, but I was pretty sure Bit was safe, but Bit was not safe. We have a missile drone back here, an Imatron here, and it's just Tegas and Dadarazis ready to run up behind this building. They will die if they come out this way or through here, but their initial impetuous move is safe. We've got the biker who rolled up, nothing that I can remember, an Ardrone, and then the Samaritan is nooked in here. This is very like forward facing and ready to go. It's a terrible deployment for any kind of defense. And in fact, deploying like this generally is risky because you won't always move all of those pieces but I had to take the risk with the impetuous pieces and the rest were kind of well protected. My anathematic was reserved drop, so it was uh, hidden deployed here, and it was actually hidden deployed hoping that Ed would pop a Greif operator down there. Killing the missile launcher is a good way to defang part of my list. In particular, it's a good way to defang part of the list that is strong against Spiral Core because I don't want to attack into Helots. Um, but Ed did not oblige and he would end up popping down his Rife Operator there, which was really, really fucking annoying and well played. Um, Ed's defense is also worth mentioning here, and it was very solid. So you can see these are the HVTs I'm trying to rescue. Every HVT would be either inside zone of control of an eraser or trigger area of a mine or both. 
there would end up being, there was like a, a mine here, there was a mine here, a mine here, a mine, uh, three mine, four mines, and like there was a mine back here. And there was an eraser here and an eraser here or here. So this, oh, this area is covered by an eraser and this area is covered by an eraser. Only this HVT here off on my right is not in a razor area. This is where I start to realize that my list choice is going to be a pain, even if I have made the like safe pick of not exposing myself to a big enemy gun. Uh, sorry, to a not big enemy gun, but a, a significant anti-tag firepower because there is a lot of AP and K1 on my opponent's side of the table. This is one of only two games that I played at Nova Corps that would not be decided relatively early. This went, this went the distance. And it went the distance because of how effective a defense Ed can run. Um, I knew better than to just try and smash my face right into it. And I basically went about teasing things out as best I could. The impetuous stuff moved forward, yada, yada. The bulk of my first turn, apart from like, there is one Tega creature. I think it runs to here and then to here. And then it moves to here, detonates two mines, dodges, and somehow gets into close combat with a Drahl, which is hilarious. Um, it will stay in close combat until my next turn, at which point I make a mistake with it that I hope I will remember to talk about then. Um, which is magnificent. I love Tiger creatures. I know it does any damage, but it, it defanged two mines, which is just sweet. Um, the bulk of my turn... So that Tiger is spending all of combat group 2's order, orders, except for like one or two. The bulk of my turn is the Umbra Samaritan. It sneaks in through this building, moves up to here, grabs this civilian, spotlights this, there's a Drahl in this building here who promptly eats a missile for its troubles. And then I, I run away basically. And I get it up onto this rooftop and the civilian importantly stands in the doorway. I can use super jump to get up there, but the only way onto that rooftop otherwise is by manually climbing or using a ladder. Uh, and so I just park, the ladder is inside the building. So I just park the, I park the civilian in the doorway. Uh, civilians do not block line of fire and they do not interfere with impact templates, but they do block movement. This is not as damaging a first turn as I would like, and it's going to kind of set the tone. Ed's counter, counter, not even a counter attack, Ed's counter grab is sort of equally sensible. Um, the bulk of his turn is spent moving this drill around here, up here, gets one kill, taking out bit and thus also kiss. That's pretty good. And it basically grabs this, it has to do a bit of movement prone because I have a Toronto HMG. It, uh, it grabs this civilian and it runs away, leaving a mine behind it. So he has successfully exfiltrated. The civilian itself is in the dead zone, but the drill is sort of nice and safely back. And he scored one kill. I think he has enough orders. No, that's, that's all that he does this turn, which passes the turn to me. So at this point, I am left with, I've taken the only long hanging fruit. All of the civilians remaining. I've cleared the mines, but the erasers have to be dealt with. So at this point, I have to just bite the bullet. And the anathematic appears and moves up and around here. It actually cops a wound from the mine the Drahl left behind, which is a pain, but needs must. And I have to, at this point, just walk into a jammer area. I face to face it with a spotlight. It's 1 dice 16 versus 1 dice 13. This could easily have gone very badly, but I win the face to face roll and drop a missile on her which takes out the delegate. I grab the um, civilian on a 19 and I run the hell away. I actually try to spotlight the drill on the way past. And I think I do even, but for, I just don't have time or orders to missile it for whatever reason. Um, maybe I don't even succeed. I'm sure something happens, but the bulk of my turn is spent getting one civilian back and, uh, and into my deployment zone. I... I'm not even sure if I get the Umbra back either. I think I leave it where it is for the moment. On Ed's second turn, again, he's only lost a couple of pieces. Um, he he tries to push in, and the bulk of what he does is he takes this Harry's team, the only triad that he's got, with a uh, Kursil K1, Nima Sitar, who is pretending to be a tag sniper. I know, and Ed knows that it's not Nima Sitar, and the Kriegel. And, ah, this is what I meant to talk about. Right, the mistake I made. So, there is a Drahl back here engaged by a, uh, a Tega creature. 
I elect to take an impetuous order and make a berserk attack to consume the symbiome. I should not have done so. The value that the Taiga creature had just staying in melee, pinning that drow in place, and then forcing Ed in his turn to spend orders killing it was higher than letting him kill it in ARO and thus um, free up orders during his next active turn. Uh, there was a very slight... Here's a fun interaction, by the way. Ferroware is a ballistic skill attack. If you fire Ferroware into close combat, it does not function as this, the same way as hacking into close combat does. You can hit your own troops with Ferroware and jammers. So don't do that. Ed actually did that, but we just walked it back because he didn't realize what the interaction was. So Ed's turn is that this uh, this Harry's team here pops out this way, moves up this way, and it is attempting to maybe steal one or both of these civilians. What it does is it walks into a repeater that I, I've moved this R drone up and it walks into this repeater area and just starts getting spotlit. But before it pulls back, realizing that it's running into trouble, it isolates my Umbra, which breaks the Sibi backstay, which is a pain in the ass. Because I am now have to I have to clear the isolate state on the Umbra, which is hard, and I have to get the civilian back. I get very lucky here, and on one of the resets as Ed is walking away. I actually roll a five and clear isolated, but that does not restore the Sibi back state. So on my turn, I am left with relatively few options. All I can really do is the Umbra pops down, grabs the civilian and runs away. So I now have two civilians in my deployment zone. And then I run the biker up here. And what it's hoping to do is, like, I only have like one order to fire a missile. I clean up the sniper, because uh, just the combat groups are beginning to collapse. I clean up the sniper, the biker is attempting to grab this civilian, but it has to survive one hit to do so. It doesn't, and it dies. I don't remember what actually kills it. It might be like a drawl. It might be a, maybe I have to dodge one of the last remaining mines. I can barely remember, but it, it cops it and it dies, leaving me with the only way I can score any remaining points is that a Dadarazi runs around to here to hide and secure its HV tape. Now, I am still up, and in particular, Ed and I are both running out of orders. The fight has gotten scrappy. He recognizes that there's probably no way he can kill my anathematic or my Umbra. They're both very well protected. But he workshops out a way that he can potentially score a tie. I have not secured my HVT, but I have two HVTs. So I have not done my classified, and I'm securing the HVT with a very exposed model. I have two civilians synchronized, in my deployment zone, none in my dead zone. Ed has one in his dead zone. He determines that if he can secure the HVT to rob me of my classified and do his, and he does, and I don't know what it is, but I know he does his classified, um, and he can synchronize a civilian, the game will be a draw. And he has exactly enough orders basically to make that play. He moves the Oh, uh, there's like a what is it? It's the, it's one of it's the surviving lieutenant Kriegel agent out this way. He actually just wants to drop smoke on the Dadarazi, and I am willing to let him drop smoke on the Dadarazi. We have a face to face roll, and like everyone whiffs, so he does it again, and then smoke pops down. Uh, so the Dadarazi is in smoke, which is fine for me. I want to secure the HVT, but then the Kriegel agent moves up and around and secures mine. All it does is it denies me of points. Um, but it is, it is Ed playing the game to the best of his ability. He had to deal with the Tadarazi first so that this Drahl could activate and move. Now, I have an Umbra Samaritan... Sorry, I have a um, Chironted with Heavy Machine Gun here. The Drahl does this, like, exactly to the point. She moves up using stealth to here, hides down here, cautious moves around here, and at this point, I realized that I have had a million dodges with this R drone that I failed to take, so I could not move to this window to stop her. She makes the cautious move, six inches, and with the last order, she declares synchronize the civilian as her first short skill, synchronize the civilian as her second short skill. She's out of line of fire of everything. She needs to roll a 16 on one of two dice. She succeeds, and the game ends with a five, five draw. Now, Ed could have voluntarily not, like the, the interesting thing about this, right, is that uh, the difference between a five, five all draw and a five, six loss 
makes no difference to the loser. That only matters to the person who has six points. So Ed could have theoretically not moved his Kriegel in to secure the HVT and scored the same number of points. And if Canberra had been playing super hard for the Red K Cup at Nova Corps, that is maybe something that we could have done. But this was a tournament game and we played it as a tournament game and Ed played the last turn exactly the way he could, exactly the way he did, and it was a fantastically well executed series of moves that brought the game to a five point apiece draw, which meant that Canberra, the Canberra's two best players in first and second place at the time of the event, knocked each other out of contention, both for podium or for first place, um, or playing on top table in the final round, and in the end would also knock us out of the red K car. So unfortunately, that cursed artifact has not made its way back into Canberra hands. It would eventually go to New South Wales and very well played to both um, both New South Wales players who came in uh, first and third, I think, to clinch the majority of that state's, the state's points in that. And there was a fifth or sixth player as well that did very, very well. So New South Wales brought some absolute crackers to the event. Really, really well played. Um, and yeah, this was, this was the draw I had. I did not have a winning record. Um, I played into another Canberran who knew my bullshit, uh, and I, Ed, likewise, probably feels the same way. And so this is the first draw I have had in an event in a very long time. Uh, they're pretty rare in Infinity. This is one of them. Uh, so that put me four, four wins, so three wins and a draw, heading into the final round, which I hope you will stay tuned for.